The USS Gerald Ford replaces what the Navy called its Nimitz-class aircraft carriers, a fleet of 10 nuclear warships designed in the late 1960s and commissioned in May 1975. The Nimitz class is still in operation, but in 1996, Navy officials knew they'd need a new ship for the 21st century. The Navy wanted to house at least 75 aircraft on the new ship's deck, and it wanted a better nuclear energy system. As designs progressed, those requests became more precise and more numerous. Newport News Shipbuilding Company worked to turn those requests into reality. First, the company decided the Ford would use electricity for power instead of steam. In, in the Nimitz class carrier, you had a lot of service steam. Whether it went to the laundry, the galley, a lot of areas of the ship. So here, we replaced all that with, with electrical powered systems. So there's less maintenance to do, right? Those steam pipes corrode. You have to go do maintenance on the valves and uh, flush them, you know, re cut them out, replace and overhauls. Here, you won't have to do any of that. The cable is, is designed to last the life of the ship, very low maintenance. That would allow for a host of new innovations. Four of those new innovations stand out. The first is something called flexible infrastructure architecture. This is a modular design concept. So if the Navy wants to convert a room from being a storage space into a boardroom, for example, it can do that without having to hire big crews to take care of the work. Another innovation is advanced weapons elevators. Relying on electromagnetic fields instead of cables, these massive elevators can carry twice as much material than their predecessors. So we have one less aircraft elevator than uh, Nimitz class. This has three as opposed to the four. Um, all that was part of the design to enhance flight deck usage. So that's a, a, a key aspect, right? That's what the carrier does. A third major change is the use of an electromagnetic aircraft launch system. Known as EMALs, these use an electromagnetic field to catapult aircraft into the sky. Previous versions of these launchers use steam and cables. Compared with their predecessors, EMALs are lighter, smaller, more efficient, and more reliable. They can also launch a fighter jet every 45 seconds. And then there's the multifunction radar. Known as a dual band radar, these combine the tools used for big picture scans as well as precision targeting. In the past, those activities were completely separate. Now those two pieces are the same. This means fewer radar antennas are spinning and fewer people are required to keep tabs on the ship's surroundings. I've had the pleasure to serve on a lot of carriers. I was most recently the executive officer on Harry S. Truman. Before that, I served on the conventional carriers Kitty Hawk and Constellation. But my first deployment and first carrier that I was ever on was the Theodore Roosevelt. I did that back as a junior officer for Desert Storm. This ship is so different from any other ship that I've ever been on. And, and that holds true for all of our sailors. You know, no matter how many aircraft carriers you've been on before, You've never been on a Ford-class aircraft carrier. Everything we do is different. Uh, we've got a new reactor design. The way we launch and recover aircraft is different. The simple things as far as how we heat the water is different. We've gone to virtually an all-electric ship. It's going to be more networked and more connected, if you will, uh, than any other ship. By moving the island to aft, we've really improved the, the layout of the flight deck. So when aircraft land, they'll be able to come back, uh, refuel, and rearm in, a, in kind of a pit stop type of a model, uh, really kind of modeled after NASCAR. You combine all that, and we've been able to reduce the manpower in this ship, the crew size, by about 600 people. Now, 600 folks is a lot, but when you figure 600 sailors over a 50 plus year life of the ship and uh, also a design that has streamlined our maintenance requirements and, and more robustly designed equipment. Uh, that's about a four to five billion dollar savings over the life of the ship and total operational costs. So there is a, uh, a high bill up front for this carrier without a doubt as a first of class, but it is designed from the outset to operate uh, more efficiently and to uh, have greater availability to the uh, reduced maintenance requirements.
Navy Aircraft Carrier, Gerald R. Ford, CBN 78, truly and fairly late. In naming CDN 78 after President Ford, we are bestowing an appropriate honor on a distinguished public servant who had a deep and personal connection with aircraft carriers throughout his life. No one would have appreciated more the honor of having a carrier named after him than President Ford. May the future sailors of USS Gerald R. Ford always show themselves to be worthy of their ship's name, and may they always honor the legacy of a great man. Gerald R. Ford continues our tradition of building quality ships. It is our duty, it is our responsibility, and indeed our great privilege. In time of crisis, and there were many during his presidency, President Ford and the presidents that have followed asked this one question, where are the aircraft carriers? Every day inches us closer to that day when the response from our Navy will be, Mr. President, Gerald R. Ford stands ready, awaiting your orders. Our Navy remains a symbol of the United States, of our dedicated and skilled sailors, of our technological genius and our massive but controlled military strength, which patrols the oceans of the world on a mission of peace. Gentlemen, welcome to the christening of the Gerald R. Ford CVN 78. I'm Jennifer Dunn, Director of Communications at Newport News Shipbuilding, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this morning and to introduce our platform guests. If everyone could please rise as the official party takes its place on the platform. Please welcome Captain Jerome Henson, U.S. Navy Chaplain. Captain Kevin Terry, Supervisor of Shipbuilding, Newport News. Captain John Meyer, Commanding Officer, Gerald R. Ford, CVN 78. <laughs> Rear Admiral Thomas Moore, Program Executive Officer, Aircraft Carriers. <laughs> Vice Admiral David Buss, Commander, Naval Air Forces and Commander, Naval Air Force, U.S. Pacific Fleet. And now, please welcome our Matron of Honor, Mrs. Tyne Berlanga, escorted by Newport News shipbuilder Kevin Stewart. And please welcome our second Matron of Honor, Mrs. Heather Devers, escorted by Newport News shipbuilder Gerald Barnes.
The Honorable Rob Whitman, U.S. House of Representatives, 1st Congressional District, Virginia. The Honorable Randy Forbes, U.S. House of Representatives, 4th Congressional District, Virginia. The Honorable Bobby Scott, U.S. House of Representatives, 3rd Congressional District, Virginia. The Honorable Sean Stackley, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Research, Development, and Acquisition. <laughs> Mr. Mike Petters, President and CEO, Huntington Ingalls Industries. <laughs> Admiral John Richardson, Director, Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program. Admiral Jonathan Greener, Chief of Naval Operations. The Honorable Carl Levin, U.S. Senator, Michigan. The Honorable Robert McDonald, Governor of Virginia. The Honorable Donald Rumsfeld. The Honorable Richard Cheney. And now, please welcome our ship sponsor, Susan Ford Bales, accompanied by Newport News Shipbuilding President, Matt Mulheron. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for the Parade of the Colors and the National Anthem. President Gerald R. Ford is the only U.S. President to attain the rank of Eagle Scout, the highest honor of the Boy Scouts of America. In recognition of this achievement, we are fortunate to be joined by hundreds of Boy Scouts from Virginia and from President Ford's hometown, Grand Rapids, Michigan. The Parade of Colors today is by the Eagle Scout Color Guard from the Colonial Virginia Council Boy Scouts of America. This will be followed by the National Anthem performed by the Victor's Quartet from the University of Michigan, President Ford's alma mater. Color Guard, Parade the Colors. So proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red rocket's red glistening through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, see, does that star-spangled banner yet?
color guard, retire the colors. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Captain Jerome Henson to deliver the invocation. Let us pray. Almighty God, in times long past, the christening of a warship was a test of integrity as the ship would slide down the ways and into the water for the first time. The builder's professional integrity was matched by the ship's watertight integrity. How fitting, Lord, that this morning we gather to christen a ship whose namesake personified integrity as an Eagle Scout, naval officer, husband, father, and yes, President of the United States. As the bottle breaks on the bow of the USS Gerald R. Ford, O oh Lord, May the very molecules of the ship sing with it. May it be, O oh Lord, that the spirit of the crew exemplify it. May it be, O oh Lord, that at every moment of testing, our nation may be found worthy of it. For it is only with integrity at the helm that the blessings of liberty may be safeguarded from now until the end of the ages. Bless this ship, her sponsor, the builders and crew as we look forward to the day when she may be underway and at sea in your service. We pray, amen. Please be seated. The United States Navy is at risk right now, this very minute. Wave after wave of unwanted intrusions capable of striking anywhere on the planet, including right here at home. The probes are invisible, but they could potentially cripple our forces with as much devastation as any bomb or missile. This is all occurring in cyberspace, the worldwide domain where communications, intelligence gathering, Kinetic operations, logistics, and command and control can be threatened at network speed. But the U.S. Navy stands ready to repel this threat and to maintain superiority in this new operational domain. The cyber warriors of U.S. Fleet Cyber Command and U.S. 10th Fleet help operate and assure the security of Navy networks around the world, providing powerful cyber capabilities necessary for warfighting superiority across the full spectrum of military operations. Any entity with access to the Internet can operate in cyberspace, including criminals, terrorists, hacktivists, and nations large and small. As vast as the Internet has become, cyberspace is even larger, with virtually all commerce and communications passing through electronic networks. From GPS systems to wireless phones, credit card scanners to automatic climate control systems, and the U.S. power grid, all are vulnerable to cyber attack, and so is our military. Each day, the Department of Defense alone receives six million probes. The traditional operational domains of maritime, land, air, and space have definite boundaries that separate one from the other. But a fifth operational domain, cyberspace, crosses all domains. Cyberspace is where the battles of the future will be won or lost. Tenth Fleet is no stranger to unconventional missions. In World War II, submarines were the new menace, changing the very conventions of naval combat. Tenth Fleet was formed to counter that threat, unifying intelligence and operations in one command for the first time. Today's Tenth Fleet continues that tradition. The Chief of Naval Operations established U.S. Fleet Cyber Command and recommissioned U.S. 10th Fleet as the Navy's central operational authority for cyber, electronic warfare, networks, cryptology, signals intelligence, and information operations. 
This represents a landmark transition in the evolution of naval warfare, bringing information to the forefront of the Navy's 21st century arsenal. Almost every operation on board a naval vessel functions in cyberspace. It is the primary medium for Navy command and control, communications, computer, combat systems, and intelligence capabilities. All these systems must function effectively, even in the face of degradation or outright attack. That's the job of U.S. Fleet Cyber Command and U.S. 10th Fleet. To assure command and control, the Navy must maintain dynamic situational awareness. This is constant and total awareness in real time of the state of our networks and communications capabilities. I'm seeing a drop in capacity centered in the Typhoon off Japan. We need to reroute our traffic until we can make sure it's reliable. An extension of dynamic situational awareness is dynamic network defense. The ability to proactively counter intrusions or hostile acts against our networks before they disrupt our operations and to seamlessly maintain continuity of command and control. Battle watch, Captain. I'm detecting a large amount of traffic flowing into the Fifth Fleet Mock. Sir, our network sensor grid is indicating a malicious signature there as well. I believe they're probing our premise router and are getting ready to launch a denial of service attack. Block an incoming source IP address and have Intel pass it to U.S. Cybercom J2. Yes, sir. Sir, we got him. Good work. Dynamic network defense and situational awareness are necessary to enable 10th Fleet's third responsibility, full-spectrum cyberspace operations. This refers to a wide range of non-kinetic effects that can be used independently or to complement kinetic actions. Cyberspace operations can be as effective as a bomb or missile, but can be conducted from virtually anywhere on the planet, in real time. The sailors of 10th Fleet are cyber warriors, conducting operations in a critical modern domain. They're a force multiplier for both kinetic and non-kinetic naval operations, delivering timely mission-critical information and capabilities to our commanders and operating forces worldwide. We're actually out here uh, performing flight tests for the F-35C to open up the flight envelope and see what we can learn to get the F-35 ready for carrier evolution, launch, and recovery. The difficulties of maintaining this aircraft on Nimitz is that, one, it's the first time we've ever brought this type of aircraft aboard. With the training that we go through 
we have to go very slow to ensure that every step, every step is done safely. Uh, the sailors on the Nimitz were prepared that we had a small contingent come out to us in Pax River, Maryland, and we provided a small cadre course for the individuals to learn about the F-35, uh, taxi and towing, learning all the intricacies of the F-35 that no others would see unless they were inside the program. Every moment being on the deck, working on the aircraft, uh, being around, working with the crew, bringing the aircraft up and down on the elevators. I think every day is a new, new challenge, new excitement, and we learn something new every single day, every time we move the aircraft. Every moment we're learning something new about the aircraft and how it interacts with the flight deck crew and the aircraft carrier itself. So it's pretty tough to learn on the fly, but that's what we're doing out there. That's what we've trained for on back at Pax River for the past five years for the aircraft. And I know everybody had the same feeling for the aircraft when it, it came in, it touched, it trapped. And then the next day when it launched off, it was still wonderful. Not every day you get to make history, and we made history with the F-35C for the Navy as a whole. I'm uh, Dr. Thomas McKenna. I'm a program officer at the Office of Naval Research. So there's substantial losses incurred when you have a major fire, when you can't suppress it at an early stage. SAFER is the uh, shipboard autonomous firefighting robot. And this is a program uh, that's been going on for about five years, basically to develop a humanoid capable of fire suppression. My name is John Farley. I work at the Naval Research Laboratory, and I'm the director of the Shadwell, which is the Navy's fire test ship. If we have a shipboard fire, we have to be able to quickly get it under control, 
and then regain the ship's ability to maintain its fighting mission. You know, we have not only the ship, but we have ordnance on board, and we have a lot of flammable systems on board. Sometimes it's hard to keep the sailors up to the latest as far as training is concerned. Or sometimes they could create an environment and make it worse. Now the robot could be uh, trained and constantly updated to make sure that the conditions are not as bad as what a human could make it. Well, our objectives for the demo on the Shadwell were to show that the, the robot could walk over what was a very uneven floor, that it could uh, orient itself to the fire, that it could autonomously handle the hose, operate the hose, aim the hose, and suppress the fire, which it succeeded in. I'm Brian Latimer. I'm an associate professor at Virginia Tech in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Now, I think robots are well suited to be sent into those environments and bipedal humanoid robots are particularly good for those applications because even in the tight, confined conditions that you might have inside of structures, these types of robots can uh, be designed to maneuver in those uh, conditions. Uh, Safer is an electromechanical robot, so it's driven by batteries and all the motors are electrical. So we put a rain gear type suit on the robot just to protect it from those types of uh, basic uh, steam, particulate, and water drop hazards. So we have uh, visible cameras on board the robot. We have something called a LiDAR, which is a rotating laser that gives the location of the points in the field of the view of the robot. And then lastly, we have uh, stereoscopic uh, thermal imaging cameras that the robot uses to uh, detect and locate the position of a fire so they can suppress it. We combine the notion of uh, smart sensors in the spaces, micro flyers that can uh, fly even in smoke, go through those extremely narrow doors that it could locate uh, fires and operate in those hallways even in dense fire smoke. And it succeeded, all those tasks. So today was the first time we came on board uh, an actual Navy ship. We were able to do a lot of things uh, today that, that we hadn't done previously and we have a lot of hope for new advancements in the future. We have some fundamental issues in robotic mobility that we still have to address, as well as uh, working out the human uh, system uh, integration issues. And we'll continue to advance the capability with better and better demonstrations. At the current time, the robot is teleoperated, so you have operators uh, standing off with the computer console. Where we're, we intend to go, is to have a combination of natural language and gesture control. The robot has gone through amazing transition within four years. And I think it's a worthy investment for a long-term project. But it's going to take a lot of time, a lot of dedication. And we're working towards uh, human-robot teams, what we call the hybrid force. Humans and robots working together. Over the past decade, I've watched American troops operate on the front lines of war in Iraq and Afghanistan, both as a U.S. Marine and later as a journalist. During that time, two things have struck me. First, Americans have developed a low tolerance for seeing their soldiers return home in coffins. And second, soldiers are surrounded by an overwhelming amount of new technology. It's now part of their everyday lives. These two trends are shifting the way the U.S. fights its wars. The Pentagon is currently building an army of what it calls unmanned systems. It's their fastest growing arm of development. And there's a momentum to create machines with more autonomous capabilities, robots which can take certain decisions themselves. But what will this new era of warfare look like? And do the legal and political structures exist to deal with it? 
These are big, big meta-meta changes that are happening in war that we've got to wrap our heads around. So I see this as a very major threat to respect for human rights. What is war going to look like when it's robot versus robot? Who wins that war? And, and how can you even tell? This is the largest gathering of robotics companies in the world. It's organized by AUVSI, the Association of Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. So these are successfully used in operations at the reactors. Hundreds of private corporations and university researchers are here to show off their latest cutting edge inventions. And so there's things that we can actually pick up with the gripper, use them to defuse a bomb, and then put them back. <laughs> They're all either selling their products or soliciting funds for their projects. And most of them are targeting a single customer with deep pockets, the U.S. military. This is an annual conference for the robotics industry in Washington, D.C. Years ago, this was a pretty small gathering. This year, there'll be over 7,000 attendees. It's an enormous business here now. Uh, it covers everything. You'd be surprised what you could find. Everything from unmanned uh, boat ships, submarines, to armed drone helicopters. And just the air portion of the robotics or unmanned industries this year will be worth $7 billion. In 2009, the U.S. Defense Department earmarked $18 billion over five years for the development of unmanned systems. This boom in military robotics comes off the back of the so-called global war on terror. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, along with lethal action in Pakistan and Libya, have created a political and strategic space for unmanned robotic systems. It's not a situation where you're in these big you know, formation operations or fights. You're dealing with, with very explosive, very spontaneous events. So you need something that's watching all the time and something that's very adaptable to be able to move in from one location to another very, very quickly. The U.S. Air Force is presently training more unmanned systems operators than it's training manned fighter plane and manned bomber plane pilots put together. But that actually makes perfect sense because they're actually buying more unmanned systems than they're buying manned fighter planes or manned bomber planes. The number of drones in use by the U.S. military has surged from a handful in 2001 to over 7,000 today. And the number of ground robots has shot from zero to 12,000. When you start to take a look, the amount of robot research funded by the U.S. military is astonishing. Fault lines put in more than 100 requests and follow-ups to the Pentagon, military contractors, private robotics companies, and university research labs. But gaining access to see how these tax dollars are put into use isn't easy. When we could actually get a response, it was almost always a firm no. After several months of chasing, only a handful agreed to allow us to film. Tardek was one of them. It sits on a base just outside Detroit, Michigan. Do you just want to try it out? Drive? Seriously? That's it. An Army research facility from World War II. It used to build tanks. Wow, look at that. Now much of their work is dedicated to robotic technology. What we're looking at here at Tardec is unstructured environments. So robots that can move out of, out of uh, the area of very strict programming. So one of the ways of doing that is through teleoperation. So we have, um, you know, it's not the classic robot. It's somebody actually controlling something. It's not a remote controlled car because they're doing it through a TV set. All the robots here are collaborations between Tardec and private companies or university labs, or both. Companies like iRobot in Bedford, Massachusetts. This is the home of the PacBot, one of the first ground-based robots the U.S. military adopted after 9-11. Thousands are being used in Iraq and Afghanistan to defuse improvised explosive devices, or IEDs. The old way of doing business was to ask an individual 
uh, our sons, our daughters, our brothers, our sisters, uh, to mount up one of those uh, heavy, cumbersome, hot bomb suits and literally to waddle out to go face to face with an IED. Today, we do that at distance and we do it virtually via a robot. Much, much better way to do business. So the interesting thing about this one is light. It weighs about five pounds or so. And here's what the military wanted. A robot that you could throw, say over a wall or something, and then look, it writes itself. And now you can see over that wall with the cameras on that robot. With video game-like controllers, soldiers can guide recon robots like this one to see over walls or defuse bombs. These ground-based robots add a buffer between the soldiers that use them and a potential threat, whether it's a bomb or a human enemy. But technology designed to save lives can be easily modified to kill. The step between putting a laser beam on someone's forehead it's not a technologic leap to then putting a bullet in their forehead. It's actually a legal political question. We feel strongly and ethically that there has to be a man in the loop. If you look at the history of, of any military technology, it typically starts in reconnaissance, uh, then becomes frustrated that you see bad happenings but can't deal with them, and it evolves to strike. Really, the technology will happen. It's how we're going to deal with that technology. While the idea of arming ground robots still seems taboo, in the air, it's a line that has long been crossed. At a Utah Army testing facility, the military has invited members of the media to a display of its unmanned aerial systems. Um, we're going to showcase that entire package for you here today in a way that I think uh, is going to really resonate with you once you see what's uh, inside and behind the curtain. It's the largest drone demonstration the U.S. Defense Department has ever allowed to be filmed. As the drones fly overhead, journalists watch the mock operation from inside a hangar. From 7,000 meters in the air, the Gray Eagle hunts its target. It's estimated that the Pentagon will invest nearly $37 billion toward drone development through 2020, advancing unmanned systems more than piloted aircraft. Oh, I, I think it's fundamentally changed warfare. I, I think it's fundamentally changed the way we operate. I think eventually it's going to fundamentally ch change the way we live in the United States. And now we have a technology that allows you to carry out acts of force without having to think about some of the consequences, the political consequences of sending sons or daughters into harm's way. So in my mind, the, the barriers to war in our society, they were already being lowered. Now we have a technology that literally takes those barriers to the ground. Apache 17, track target two. All of which make it such an attractive tool for the U.S. But drones are some of the most controversial weapons in the American arsenal, particularly in their use for targeted killings, a phrase first termed under the Bush administration's so-called war on terror, to use lethal force against specific individuals. It means killing people, often outside official war zones. The program has been ramped up under the Obama administration in places where uh, there would be very serious geopolitical ramifications and the ramifications of American lives being placed on the ground in those dangerous situations, the drone appears like a silver bullet. Pakistan has borne the brunt of the silver bullet. And it's all secret. The CIA, not the military, runs the Pakistani drone program. The CIA is not required to offer any information about its operations, how it selects its targets, who's in charge, and how many people are killed. And the Obama administration will not officially discuss the CIA drone program, not even to confirm or deny its existence.
If they can't even say the word, where's the accountability? How could we even know how well this program is working, even if you want to put aside the questions about whether we should be um, using drones as, as instruments of war? There's just so little transparency and so much opacity when it comes to this program, when it belongs to the CIA, that some people now think if it belonged to the military, you could at least get uh, more insight into how it works and then debate about whether it should be run this way. Reportedly, civilians and private contractors control the CIA drones, pushing a button from their offices thousands of miles away in Langley, Virginia. At the time this film was made, there have been 308 drone strikes reported in Pakistan since 2004. 256 of those under President Obama. That figure could be far higher. Over 200 strikes hit the region of Waziristan alone. Roughly one attack every four days. Conservative estimates put the total number of deaths around 2,900. Of those, over 750 were civilians, including 175 children. And at least 1,100 people have been injured. The CIA and the Obama administration have extended these strikes to Yemen and Somalia. And according to recent U.S. diplomatic cables released by WikiLeaks, the United States is building secret drone bases in places like Ethiopia and the Seychelles, an indication that Washington wants to increase surveillance and strikes in the region. At least a dozen strikes have been carried out in Yemen, one of which in late September killed Anwar al-Awlaki, an American-born imam with alleged ties to al-Qaeda. The willingness to target and kill a U.S. citizen provides just one example of how this secret war often operates beyond recognized legal boundaries. If a intelligence operation carries out an airstrike that goes awry, that accidentally kills civilians, that violates the rules of engagement, there's not a court-martial process set up for that. There is, in my view, at the end of the day, no accountability for what is going on now. Philip Alston spent six years studying the legality of the U.S. drone program for the United Nations Human Rights Council. The congressional committees have, as far as anyone knows, never exercised oversight in any specific way in relation to these killings. He says that the American government's justification for the strikes, self-defense in response to 9-11 even now, 10 years later, is a manipulation of the international laws governing conflict. Now, in terms of international law, that represents a fundamental breakdown in what are called the rules on the use of force. It would enable the United States to use force against any target, any country, any time. Following 9-11, Congress passed a resolution called the Authorization for Use of Military Force, or AUMF. It allows the U.S. president to use military force anywhere against people believed to be responsible for 9-11. And when the Obama administration has been asked, what authorities do you possess to go you know, into Yemen, to go into Somalia, uh, even you know, outside Afghanistan, into Pakistan, uh, for the purposes of, of attacking people that you say are aligned with al-Qaeda, they use the AUMF. I think the US is certainly risking setting itself up for a, a significant a global backlash against its extension of power extraterritorially. But the bigger problem, of course, is other states saying, well, this is the norm. You do it. Why shouldn't we do it? The UN Human Rights Council has taken no action to further investigate the legality of the U.S. drone program. While the U.S. continues to expand the program, 45 other nations are working on their own drones many being sold on the open market. In the rush to churn out robotic military systems, who buys these technologies and how they're used has minimal international oversight. In short, the law is not keeping up with the pace of development. You know, technology doesn't stop, and that's, I think, one thing that people need to realize is that it's accelerating ever faster, not just in the number that we're using it, but how advanced it is. The accelerated pace of development is such that it is inevitable that we are creating machines that are going to be able to do things we cannot currently conceive of them doing. I think if the United States were serious, part of this major program to 
if you want to create a wood to robotize uh, its wall making functions would be to build in various safeguards designed to ensure respect for the laws of war. There has been a mad dash for advancement with very little consideration for how that advancement will play out against human society. And Rita J. King is a futurist who studies the potential dangers that technological advances in robotics and artificial intelligence can bring. Within the United States, you have the military, and then you have you know, private business, and you have universities. So all these different groups are doing their own research and their own creations at different paces. And eventually, there will be more of a coming together of these different aspects of the programming and the creations, and we will cross a line. In a university lab at Virginia Tech, Professor Dennis Hong and his students work on a robotic soccer team. The real thing is if you want to use these... ...robots outside the lab in real life doing real work, then without all the skills needed to playing soccer, it won't happen. So we're actually, it's a really good controlled competition where it can develop all the technologies needed for robots to be used in real life. Virginia Tech's funding comes from a variety of sources. These robots are part of a project sponsored by the National Science Foundation. But they also take on projects financed by the U.S. military. So as a research lab, the technology we develop, we want the society to be using our technology. Of course, many of our robotics projects, most of if not all of them, are to really to help the society. But here they recognize that a technology's ultimate use is unpredictable. Time to time, uh, as a group, we sit down and uh, discuss about these kind of problems. Uh, mainly, it's very sensitive, especially for when we uh, work on uh, military-funded projects and those kind of things. But many times, we don't have any control once it leaves our hands. However, that's true for any technologies, any science besides robotics as well. It's hard to put a timeline on how fast robots and artificial intelligence will develop. But almost everyone we spoke to seemed to believe that in just a few decades, the robots that will exist in our world will be unrecognizable by today's standards. Uh, I think the probability is virtually one, a certainty that machines will be as intelligent as people, that we will have intelligent robots, that robots will be ubiquitous. So then the consensus of people in the industry is somewhere around 2025, 2030, you know, and even if you were to say, oh, that's optimistic. So maybe it's 2050. Uh, you know, maybe some of us won't be around to see it, perhaps, but it's not that far in the future. It's not a thousand years. It's not 500 years. It's certainly not never. When people say machines will never be as smart as people, never is a very long time. The robots that we create could, of course, eventually will become much smarter than we are. And because they're smarter than us, we won't be able to conceive of how smart they are. And we'll have no control over that. And I don't think our brains are really equipped to accept the enormity of, of what that means because we do find ourselves intelligent now. Science fiction stories have always made predictions about conflict between machines and people. The way to avoid that is for humans to always be at least as intelligent as their machines. While we may not know exactly if or when robots will become as intelligent as humans, at AUVSI, the talk of autonomy, of military robots taking more decisions by themselves, is growing. You know, work on you know, the next generation of autonomy, maybe before it's really needed to show where it can go. General Riggs talked about unfair advantage, and I'm in full agreement with him. We want unfair advantage. We want lots of unfair advantage. Why shouldn't we? And unmanned systems, and, and especially weaponized unmanned systems, clearly provide a huge advantage. So how far will robot autonomy go? And will a robot ever be allowed to make the ultimate decision to take a human life? Officially, the U.S. military claims there will always be a man in the loop, that a human will always make the decision to kill. But there are signs that this may not always be the case. 
In 2006, the Army funded a major study to find out if lethal autonomous robots could be programmed to act ethically on the battlefield. There's a long and rich history of war crimes in every war. Uh, we try and train our soldiers, and soldiers are instructed in this, but we are human beings. Uh, and there is emotions, there's anger, fear, frustration. We don't have to put those in autonomous systems. We can engineer out the emotions that get in the way. Ron Arkin, a professor at Georgia Tech, worked on this study and argues that robots can be more ethical than human soldiers, even in decisions to kill, by programming in what he calls founded morality. You establish a venue, a region, or a task environment, or a mission, under which the system is operating, and you engineer that system to make sure that it acts appropriately under those particular circumstances. Whether it makes that decision what to fire at, when to fire, and who to fire at, um, that I think is a critical decision that we should that we already sort of ritualize within the military decision process. And we shouldn't relinquish that. There's reasons to deny people their right to life, self-defense, uh, intervening on behalf of another to defend their life. But um, those are decisions that human agents and moral agents should be making and not automatic processes. I will never, ever make the claim that these systems will be perfect. But I do make the claim that, I, well, I, do make, I have the belief that these systems can outperform human beings uh, in the battlefield, ultimately from an ethical perspective. We do have a moral responsibility to try to prevent this and to, to not invest our time and energy and resources as scientists, as a society, into building a technology that has that kind of capacity to kill people on its own. But for now, there are no signs that research like this will stop. Because there's an assumption that underlies not only Arkin's work, but also the billions spent on defense. The assumption that war will always continue. War is a very cultural thing. It's a kind of a social deliberation instead of a moral deliberation or a cultural deliberation, if you will. Like, how do we want to fight wars? What is it to be a warrior in this society? And what does this society decide that war is about and is good for? In the past, battles had formal boundaries and ends where each side had to bury their own. But as more robots go to war on behalf of humans, what stake does society hold? As killing becomes more automated, does it make war all too easy? So I think that is a big issue as far as um, what these technologies are going to do and making war much easier to become involved in and really detaching, especially in the United States, the American public from its sense of responsibility and, and moral and social deliberation that should go into deciding when wars occur. A lot of people say, well, why don't we stop working on this technology? There's a problem, though. You'd have to stop science. It means you'd also have to first stop war and stop capitalism. And there's such a vast amount of money that goes into thinking about defense problems and solving defense problems that if we turn that time and energy and resources into solving more practical problems, uh, we would actually probably alleviate most of the social and political problems that cause us to, to have defense and security concerns. And the fact of the matter is that most of the funding that's going into robot research, of course, is to create a better war machine. And to what end? It demonstrates how far we are from the sort of intelligence we need to build robots that can help us instead of hurt us.